can take teenagers with virtually no graphic design experience or software experience and teach them how to design something in five days over the course of 15 hours. That is the challenge that begins today. And in the first part of this video, I talk about the planning that goes into something like that. Later, we talk about the idea of Keith Rowe and finding your own voice as a creative. And lastly, there's a couple clips from that class going into the idea of ideation and uh, really basic elements of research that might be interesting even to uh, working designers. Welcome to the Daily Video Blog. Everything in this episode was recorded on July 22nd. trying to record this video and get it get it started so we have an interesting challenge this week which is that I'm teaching intro to graphic design from 1230 to 4 each day so it's this program in MCAD for high school students a pre-college program they can earn one credit they take illustration in the morning and then graphic design with me in the afternoon there's a lot of challenges to this one you have the fact that you've got to find a process that can get results in that short amount of time. So you have to figure out how to show just enough of the software for them to be productive. And then against that, have tasks that can use the rest of that allotted time and also be meaningful. But my plan is to make that really short chunk of time work. So what I'm gonna have them do is design a poster using a version of the typographer method. So what that's gonna come down to is we're gonna work in these discrete phases and then take the stuff that we've made, all of which I think will be embedded with meaning, at least that's personal to them, and then we'll combine all of that at the end. And our research will hopefully guide our decisions towards the end. The thing that we're gonna avoid is coming up with a big concept because a big concept I believe for us to do a good job requires time and it requires time to work the concept and that's always the hardest thing especially if you have a room full of people who are unfamiliar with the software and then they have an idea and then you spend the week chasing how to execute on that idea. What we're gonna do instead is focus on the idea of showing them just enough, just enough of Illustrator to play with type, and then we'll focus on just enough Photoshop to experiment with processing imagery so that then they can just spend the afternoon playing with that. So with a project like that, what should the content be? And this is one that's always really hard. At first, the idea was gonna be, I was gonna pick a list of artists. Some list that I could jokingly refer to as like, truth, you know, like the 10 best living artists according to whatever, Time Magazine, or the 10 best living artists, and we would just use money as the way of doing it. But I couldn't find a list that I was happy with. And there was this additional problem, which was that if you're gonna show one artist, why wouldn't you just use photography of their work? Not that you can't do it, but it's such an obvious line of inquiry. Like any kid with their brain screwed on halfway tight is gonna do the research on Gerhard Richter see this amazing painting and be like, oh, couldn't I just use the painting? Well, then I started to think about like, what's a discipline that gets more textural? And I thought of architecture. And then I realized that like my, the best bet would be to find a group show of architect. And I was searching for that for something for a while because I don't want to have to invent it. it I, the great thing about graphic design is that you're this intermediary, you're like, you're picking up the content. 
wouldn't it be nice if I could find something that existed already? And, and then finally, I kind of ran out of time and I, I was like, well, what do I, what do I normally do for this stuff? And I remember that I always give this project in a lot of my classes as a kind of workshop based on this concert series called Meeting at Offsite. What Meeting at Offsite led to was the development of a musical movement that came to be known as Onkyo E. And I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but whatevs. Which was this hyper quiet, essentially noise music or free jazz, depending on how you put it, that was defined in large part by silence and a kind of extreme approach to listening because of these paper thin walls in offsite, the gallery where this concert series took place, everyone basically had to make non-amplified music. There's a like a five disc compilation of music from offsite and I swear to God, it's hard to know when something has even started. This very kind of extreme but gentle form of music. One of the reasons that I use the off-site concert series as content for a project is because it's hard to research. The only real documentation that I can find is an article that was published in The Wire around 2001 by Clive Bell. That's where almost everything I know about it came from and it's utterly fascinating. So they can read that. You can basically read about the page on the compilation CDs. And nowadays you can find that compilation on YouTube and you can listen to some of the music. But like just doing a, a kind of a cursory get acquainted once again search yesterday, no concerts showed up. So the appeal of using something that's difficult to research is because one, the designer has to rely entirely on developing a perspective. You can't hide behind the brand. You can't hide behind an existing visual language. This is such a micro movement that it's not even like you could find a, say a, a techno artist, maybe like a pioneering techno artist you're gonna find a visual language related to techno at least. For this, you're not gonna find a visual language related to it. You're only gonna find the packaging of the CDs. So there's this real power in having something that's difficult to research, but the stuff that's there is quality to research and you really have to develop your own perspective. The second reason for using something so obscure is that the students won't have any predetermined notions about it. When people have a predetermined idea about something, then they get attached to that vision of it. So this is like as close as I can come to just utterly inventing something. Last semester, I had my students design a film festival. And the first thing they have to do is develop the concept, the actual like curatorial concept behind the film festival. The point of doing that is that if they invent a micro genre, they can't just lean on a genre. They have to have a perspective. They can play with visual languages, but they can't just go like, oh, it's action movies. I think a big part of designing projects for students to do is to make sure that you're destroying loopholes, you're tying them up. Additionally, I want to avoid giving students assignments that the people they meet with and show their work to will have the same predetermined opinions about. I made a video a long time ago called Never Redesign a Joy Division Record. Just to give a really extreme example, if you were to have students redesign a Joy Division package, the response would almost certainly be negative. And the point of it is to say that if you show up with work, especially something that means something to the viewer, they will have an intensely difficult time not seeing it through the lens that they understand it. So finding something that they have no reference for 
and that forces them to meet it head on but still be relatable that's like the huge thing is that if it's some academic bullshit it's not relatable and the person files it away I mean if they're super open-minded and awesome great but I think it's a, a fool's errand to be running around town planning everything on the idea that other people aren't gonna act like people the challenge is you find something relatable a poster for a concert series it's very relatable but then you introduce a level of content to which the designer is actually the expert they're telling you this is about this so I did this then it's up to the person reviewing it to decide whether they believe that to say oh that's interesting what about this and like so how, so what does this mean so they can start asking questions as opposed to and I've seen this happen a million times that's why I do stuff like this I've seen it a million times where the person is familiar enough with the content or the idea of the content that then they have a million ideas about this like I give these music packaging projects free jazz is a phrase that describes a super broad range of musical activity so I can give this student a free jazz record and say we're designing a new package for this you know depending on the record that record could be bordering on harsh noise and if they tell someone it's a free jazz record that person hears jazz and then fucking blue note is what they want to talk about now blue note is sick awesome amazing Reed miles is the best ever but that's an irrelevant set of associations to a um potentially a record with Thurston Moore and Matt Gustafson. What I'm trying to do is like figure stuff, figure out content that I can reverse engineer the potential reactions to it. So what the content will ultimately be is a 20th anniversary tour of North America by the core off-site improvisers and in each city they'll play with different North American improvisers. This gives me a chance to make something that's real and, and contextual, but it's got some rich content. But again, that content is obscure enough that there's no easy way out. Now the process is where this gets pretty rough because we have to figure out how to make this thing in exactly five days in three and a half hour chunks. And the way that it's going to work is today they're going to do research because we need a way to have a kind of north star in terms of feeling. That content needs to feel real for each student. They need to have their head wrapped around it so they can have some kind of perspective. We'll do an InDesign demo and design a document to hold their research so that'll be like their introductory in design layout stuff is basically just a research presentation tomorrow we'll do a quick introduction to illustrator we'll get basically acquainted with the type tools and then they're gonna start doing basic typographic layouts Wednesday we are gonna go through an exercise to generate imagery I have a feeling what I'll have them do is just pull a bunch of stuff off their phones, kind of regardless of what's there, and experiment with processing images in Photoshop. The idea that we're after is play and exploration. So our whole approach throughout the week is going to be you make a whole bunch of stuff and then you just pick out what's the best. You don't worry about making good work. You just worry about making work and taking it seriously by having fun. And then you just pick out what's good from it. Thursday rolls around and we're gonna be sitting on contact sheets of typographic layouts. We're gonna have our perspective on the content from the, re the research. We're gonna have contact sheets of image explorations and then we're going to start sketching how these pieces might live together.
and I don't know how long we'll do that for. So we'll probably sketch out a few options. We'll talk about how a conceptual idea can translate into form. You know, if you have an idea about echo, reverberation, isolation, transformation, anything that ends in shun, apparently, communicating that through composition. Or maybe not even communicating it, maybe interpreting that through composition. Once we have that handful of sketches, we'll then start building the stuff in InDesign, essentially assembling it and tweaking and modifying the stuff that we've made already to best fit these new compositional strategies or how a, a texture fits with typography. And I guess that'll be Thursday. And then Friday we'll come in, print some stuff out, do a very light and gentle kind of critique and then see if we can do a round of revisions to tighten stuff up. And then that's the week. I'm hoping that we can record a decent chunk of the class without showing the class because, you know, it's not really cool to be recording video of 16 year olds and sharing it on the internet. But hopefully we can capture some of it just to show it throughout the week because it is an interesting week. I was just reading an interview with the guitarist Keith Rowe, who is an experimental improvisational guitarist from um, uh, Great Britain, I think. And in it, he's talking about why he started playing the guitar the way that he plays it. And hold on, let's get that started. And the way that he plays guitar is that he sets the guitar on a table, modifies it with all kinds of crap, and then experiments with the sounds that he can get out of the guitar is a kind of raw material. Rowe was a painter in the 50s going to art school when he started playing guitar. And when he started playing guitar, he was a jazz guitarist. And he sort of described it as he could do a good imitation of a few different jazz guitarists. But at some point, I think someone told him, you know, you are painting to find you, but you're playing guitar like these other people. And at that point, Rowe decided to reinvent how he played guitar so that it was similar to the idea of painting and the idea of finding your own approach to the tool. It's probably no surprise, given some of the stuff I've been talking about, that I find that very interesting. The extreme he takes it to is not what interests me, but it's the spirit of it. Clearly, you can't 100% divorce yourself from the history and the physical mechanics of the instrument or tool. I see it as a situation where the ideal is to find your approach to the field, the discipline, the whatever it is, and that you don't have to go as far as Keith Rowe to where you want the guitar to sound not like a guitar and you want it to be entirely a new animal that is played in, in, in a new way. But I do think that you can get to this point where you can develop very much your own approach. Maybe you invent your own tools. Maybe your rules of engagement are quite different. And then the entire task becomes about how to elevate and amplify that. It's not out yet. There is a video about stuff like Skillshares and things like that from these like kind of famous designers. And one of the things that I was thinking about is the idea of permission. Some creative people are just wired for freedom and others aren't. They need examples and leads to follow. And I know that I'm that way. I read an interview with Peter Saville and he was talking about his early work and how he just, he had this copy of Pioneers of Modern Typography and he just kind of flipped out and was like, I'm gonna do this. And that he would find these echoes that seemed to him relevant from some element of a piece of design to the content or the music that he was working with. When I read that, 
that gave me a certain permission that my beliefs hadn't given me up to then. I felt like appropriation was always bad, that the only reason that you could sample something was for this like kind of postmodern take on transgression, these kinds of ideas. And Savile basically gave me permission to work how I needed to work and to find the approach that I needed to find. What does this have to do with Keith Rowe? The absolute ideal situation, which would never happen, but what I think would be wonderful is a kind of totally isolated approach of fumbling and fumbling and fumbling until you were making this thing that you were a master of and that could only come from you. Early on when I taught, I believed a lot of this stuff that people say about teaching, like, oh, you're not supposed to teach them design, you're supposed to teach them how to think, and you're, you're supposed to teach, like, good taste and all of this stuff. And there were two things that happened. One, I was never successful in that regard, and if I thought about my education, that people who, like, didn't care about the history and stuff like that. It's not like they ever started caring about the history. And the other thing is they were just fine. And I thought a lot about the idea of artists who are sort of terrible and amazing. One of my favorite directors is Abel Ferrara, most famous for directing The King of New York. I haven't seen probably his last two films, but a couple of his movies are my some of my favorite movies ever. Other movies are so fucking terrible, but they're super interesting. But my feeling has always been that Abel Ferrara has this weird moralistic view of everything and he's kind of bad. And he's not so bad he's good, but he's so dug in on what he's about and what he's interested in that even a bad Abel Ferrara movie is pretty interesting. And then I think about Stanley Kubrick, and this one is going to be a wildly unpopular opinion, but I tend to think that Stanley Kubrick is terrible and super interesting because he just has like the worst instincts in the world. Like every movie is way too long and actors think that he got the worst performance out of them. Totally idiosyncratic ways of working. He's trying to discover the thing, he's after the thing, and I think he's a great example of like he's breaking all these rules and you have to remember he is self-taught and then he gets somewhere interesting because of that like eyes wide shut is like awful and so interesting and i think that's a very fascinating place to be and i don't i just i don't think you can learn quote unquote good taste i think you can learn safe taste accepted taste but the best stuff comes out of escaping what everyone else is telling you is good taste and going after what resonates with you and what intrigues you. And then as you're putting stuff in, if it's a struggle to fill a single page, then you're gonna want more research in it. But the thing that I would then lean into is not you could go search for more stuff, and that's almost never a bad idea. But the other thing is the easiest form of research, and I think the default form of research, is just make a list of everything that you think about the, the thing as of this moment. Like if anybody goes into graphic design for real, 90% uh, of the time, no one gives you enough time to do anything. So your first form of research is to make a list of everything that you think about it. It's essentially like you dig into your own brain since you kind of don't have time to dig into anything else. And when you do that, state the obvious. Because right now, where we're at, we don't need to be smart or interesting at all. What we need to do is simply document what is standing out or what we know. Later, we figure out how to turn that into 
visual matter or into ideas and sincerely include the obvious. One of the phrases that I wrote down is punctuation. It's like the sound seemed to punctuate the space. That's a really, really obvious description of something that's happening. But if I turn that into a visual compositional idea, I might come up with some super interesting stuff based off of punctuation or based off of creaking or thuds. Like thuds is a kind of like dumb, obvious statement, but it's all about the execution of what do I do with these ideas. So the first thing you do is you start with any ideas that you can possibly get your hands on, regardless of the fact that they seem idiotic. So I'm gonna show a project for a couple minutes here. This is an installation in Miami during Art Basel for a Pusha T uh, EQT project an Adidas shoe franchise. Cement table, it's got a glass top with photographs underneath it. We've got these giant light boxes that are like 10 feet by eight feet. And then these like kind of not silk, but like uh, thin banners with C prints hanging from them. This is the top view of that table. So you've got campaign photography plus shoe details kind of under glass. The idea here is that uh, what Pusha T does is take his experiences and his pain and then transform them into art. I assume everyone is familiar with Pusha T. Mm -hmm. So you know that literally the only thing he talks about is crack. Yeah. So this shoe has got a, um, a koi fish pattern, because fish scale, and then the interior, this uh, footbed of the shoe is a Pyrex pattern, and then it came in a uh, giant plastic baggie. So depending on how you see it, it's either hilariously crack themed or it just runs with this thing of like, take your life no matter what went into it and turn it into art. So the concept behind this installation is that uh, we wanted to create this like art experience, very like heavy duty with all of these C prints and almost like permanent materials. This is a light box and then this is like a gigantic actual like C print that's then clamped up to it. And so the photographer Ari Markopoulos is known for uh, these very informal installations. So sometimes he just prints out giant black and white prints of his work, which is like, he's a very, I don't know, in-demand photographer. So it's a little bit off-putting that you walk into a gallery and the photography of the Beastie Boys or from that uh, Jay-Z Magna Carta record is just masking taped to the wall or gigantic photocopy. So that's what we did here. And then this is the honest to goodness ideation page for coming up with ideas for this. This is a list of everything that one could possibly think of about Pusha T, rap, and work. So literally, recording studio, mic stands, mics, fit screen, headphones, samples, keyboards, vinyl, booth, mixing room, blah, blah, blah. The way that he works is he writes everything on the road, so he has to be very diligent. So it's literally a list of words about working. Uh, a list of words about working while traveling. There's some like more, whatever, um, poetic type statements. But in general, it's these very obvious lists and then lists of stuff that it reminded me of. This idea of like being a king or being an emperor. So a list of really obvious words like throne and whatnot. And then if you had like a mobile studio, like how would you build that? And notice there is not a smart brainstorming process of, okay, so what we're gonna do, imagine. Like it's not like Mad Men. Have you ever seen Mad Men? He's like, imagine this. You know what I mean? It's not like that. It's like, what's really obvious? And then how do you put those things together? This was every single article I read in the two days prior to that to try to understand more about where he was coming from beyond listening to music. So you get from that, you take the obvious, you start to marry the obvious with the ideas that you have from the research, and then you can actually get somewhere. And then running along with that, is the visual research. So 
This is the folder of Coke themed stuff. Then there's a theme of museum storage because it's like he doesn't keep anything that he makes. It all kind of just disappears into storage. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Then the idea of impermanence and permanence because he throws away the lyric notebook, but the song lives forever. So I thought that was a kind of an interesting idea. So just photos of him at work or doing his thing. Between all of that, you make connections between things and then you start to put them together. But the one thing that you don't do is have like a genius breakthrough idea. I mean, it would be cool. I would love it if I could like do the thing where people say like, oh, I have my best ideas in the shower. But I literally, I've never had an interesting idea in the shower beyond like, I should wash my hair today. You have ideas by, you start really basic and then you just build them up and up and up. So and that's one of the reasons that once you take all the stuff you've found, then do that really basic brain dump of what you're thinking about it. Because between the stuff you've found and the really obvious, as you start to look at it, you're gonna make connections between those things, but they, they kind of have to be sitting in front of you for you to be able to analyze them. Otherwise, um, you're relying too much on your ability to think of something smart when you see another thing. What you wanna do is have both things in front of you so that you can connect them, and that's why you want that really obvious list of your thoughts. On the other hand, if you have genius ideas, like run with it, but I definitely have never had a genius idea in my life, so I have to make lists of very obvious things in order to get somewhere. So just get out of my first class, and I think the biggest takeaway I have thus far is I'm gonna have to be really explicit in instructions. Um, and I, I haven't taught high school kids in a while, so I kind of forgot about that, but yeah, it's like, if you don't say, do this, do this, do this, uh, it doesn't get done. But I think as the comfort level grows, it'll, it'll sort itself out a little bit, but yeah, I definitely forgot how sort of instruction oriented you have to be. The hardest thing about the teaching or the way that I've been doing it is trying to get people to play. I think that's what all my effort has been going into as of late is I just want people to let go and try stuff. And it's so hard to get people to do. It doesn't matter how old or how young or how experienced or how inexperienced. Getting people on that like just move fast and try a lot of stuff program, super difficult.